Welcome to the Neoliberal University, How to Defend Education, Programs, and Jobs. I'm Nancy Welch. I'm a professor at the University of Vermont and a member of UVM United Academics, our faculty union. This webinar is sponsored by Specter Journal in collaboration with Haymarket Books. Specter is a new publication and website devoted to creative and emancipatory Marxist theory, analysis, and debate. The latest issue is just hot off the press and features an essay by Robin D.G. Kelly on policing under racial capitalism. Kim Moody with a critical review of Jane McAlevey's model for organizing to build union power, a far ranging interview with Nandita Sharma on the struggle for a world without borders and never previously published material from the late Neil Davidson. Visit specterjournal.com to subscribe. If you're already a subscriber, thank you and consider making a donation. Your support enables Spectre to focus on the critical issues of our time and to do so from a standpoint that is resolutely internationalist and that approaches struggles for oppression against oppression as constitutive of class struggle. Our webinar today brings together four panelists with a long history of struggle against neoliberal defunding and deforms. We've asked them to join us today particularly to help us come to grips with the tremendous crisis that has been triggered with the neoliberal model of higher education under the twin blows of COVID and recession. To give one example from my own university, which I know will sound very familiar to many of you, no sooner had my administration thanked faculty, staff, and graduate students for the Sisyphean labor of ferrying students through pandemic learning conditions, then they turned around and really with the same breath announced hiring freezes, layoffs, pay cuts for staff and for lecturers, and a uh, restructuring scheme for the entire campus that promises to further result in downsized and eliminated programs and lost jobs. So the university has become a snake that is eating its own tail, and the necroliberal playbook looks much the same as the neoliberal playbook that we are long accustomed to, except now institutional survival and people's lives are at stake. So what to do? Um, to help us consider how faculty, staff, and students can organize to defend jobs, programs, and a future for higher ed in the United States, we are joined by Tithi Bhattacharya, a professor of South Asia Asian history and director of global studies at Purdue University, co-author of Feminism for the 99%, a manifesto, and a member of the Spectre editorial board. Chinzia Arutza, a professor of philosophy at the New School for Social Research, vice president of the New School AAUP chapter, a co-author of Feminism for the 99%, and a member of the Spectre editorial board. Kathleen Brown, a doctoral student in um, American culture at the University of Michigan, and uh, as a member of the Graduate Employees Union Local 3550, helped organize September's historic nine-day abolitionist strike, and Henry Drobin, a new school staff member with more than 12 years of higher ed labor movement um, organizing experience, and who has most recently worked with the ACT UAW 7902, AAUP, AFM 802, and IBT 1205 to form the new school labor coalition. Each of our panelists will offer opening perspectives I'll then have several follow-up questions. If you're following this webinar live, you can also use the YouTube chat to post your questions at any time 
during tonight's discussion. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to our panelists for their opening perspectives on our current crisis and the resistance we can, um, we can mount against these attacks on education, on jobs, and our lives. Um, sorry, <laughs> I hope you can hear me because uh, um, my connection is not great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nancy, for introducing this panel. I'm very happy to be here. So I will be very brief. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of data uh, concerning uh, the way in which the COVID-19 crisis has been used as, uh, um, you know, as if you were, let's say, the handbook of shock doctrine. So in other words, as an accelerator of austerity in neoliberal measures. Uh, since February, the um, uh, workforce uh, at the university, including staff uh, and, uh, and, and faculty, has shrinked of 77%. Uh, so there has been, in uh, just a few months, 7% uh, decrease in workforce uh, due to layoffs, to um, early retirement agreements, and also the, the lack of renewal of uh, uh, contracts for adjuncts and so on. Um, so we are uh, uh, calculating around 340,000 uh, uh, fewer workers um, altogether within uh, higher education in the United States. Now, um, I think that the COVID-19 crisis has been, uh, in a sense, the um, acceleration of uh, what we may call a manufactured crisis of higher education, of which um, uh, higher education uh, administrators and also uh, various politicians from both Republican and Democratic Party have been speaking uh, for, uh, for, uh, for decades. Why do I think it is a manufactured crisis? Um, and not, let's say, a natural consequence of the way uh, of, 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 of drop, uh, drops in, uh, um, in, the, in, in enrollment due to demographic reasons or things like this, which is what usually is put forward as the source of the crisis. If we look at the uh, historical trajectory of higher education in the United States, we can see that between uh, um, uh, 2008 to 2017, um, around uh, $9 billion have been uh, uh, cut from state funds to uh, universities. Um, at the same time, uh, tuition has been uh, increased of uh, around 1,000% over the course of, uh, of, the past, uh, of the past years. Um, in addition to this, uh, and in spite of all the discussions about crisis, by the various the, the, by uh, uh, university administrators, uh, um, we have seen over the course of decades the um, constant increase of uh, administrative cost, um, with the formation of a class of higher administrators uh, who are paid an exorbitant amount of money, uh, while at the same time faculty has been uh, proletarianized. So, in other words, uh, if we look, for example, at the difference between uh, today. In the 70s, uh, in the 70s, uh, uh, precarious uh, contingent faculty represented uh, a minority of the faculty, around 25%. Today, represents the large majority, around 75-80% of the faculty. Um, so, what I'm suggesting is that uh, over the course of decades, what we have seen is uh, a constant decrease in state funding an increase in tuition uh, uh, for students, uh, precarization of uh, uh, faculty, uh, and finally, the adoption of business models um, completely oriented uh, uh, on the basis of the perspective of uh, cost efficiency, quantification of outcomes and performances, uh, where basically the calculation of the efficiency and the cost efficiency of a program is determined by the job market. So in other words, by, uh, what, uh, by the measure of success that uh, graduates uh, uh, will, uh, um, will have uh, on the formal job market once they, uh, they graduate. 
Now, it is absolutely obvious that if you run um, the university as a business, uh, you end up in a crisis. It is obvious because uh, uh, higher education and education in general is, is a very costly business. Um, it, is, it has to do precisely with the reproduction of our, uh, of our society in general. Um, and, uh, uh, and usually in most countries, uh, um, it is actually, uh, it tends to be heavily um, funded by the state, if not directly public. So for example, I'm from Italy and you know, most of the university in Italy is, uh, uh, is public. However, over the course of the decades, uh, the, the neoliberal paradigm has been uh, internalized by uh, university administrators, but also uh, various legislators. Um, and uh, this has, uh, this uh, had uh, as a uh, as consequence uh, of this situation. On the one hand, uh, again, a situation of constant manufactured crisis. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, not just abandonment. Uh, and here I want to quote Nancy, uh, an article uh, um, by Nancy Welch that, uh, that made exactly this point. It's not just a neoliberal abandonment of uh, the university through cuts in funds uh, and so on. It is a, trans a deep transformation of the mission of the university and what I would personally call uh, a process of increased, uh, to use a Marxist term terminology, of increased real subsumption. So in other words, uh, once the crisis has been produced and manufactured, then the only solution that is offered is the consolidation of the partnership with the corporate world, is basically uh, giving the possibility to a big capital, uh, two corporations, to decide the curricula uh, that university should develop and to decide what, and basically through the power of money and direct intervention, decide also what programs uh, are worth uh, surviving and what programs should just be shut down because they are not uh, uh, professionalizing, they are not uh, oriented to um, the needs of the job market, the needs of uh, uh, of the industrial and financial uh, sector of uh, um, U.S. capitalism and so, and so on. The last thing I wanted to uh, mention has to do with also the, um, the disconnected to this uh, point about real increasing real subsumption, that it has to do with the, the deep transformation of the very meaning of, it, of higher education that comes along with these processes. Uh, on the one hand, with the increasing, especially in private universities, increasing uh, institution of a relationship of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, on, on the logic, uh, logic of consumers, uh, where students are basically treated and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, stimulated to think about themselves as consumers, who then ha have to evaluate whether the product they have uh, purchased is, uh, is a good one, is uh, worth the money they have invested in it. And, uh, and therefore, also the loss of the mission of, uh, of, uh, of what was supposed to be the mission of uh, higher education, which is now becoming increasingly, again, a mechanism of reproduction of skilled workers uh, uh, in a small part uh, or reproduction of, uh, uh, um, of a you know, class elite and so on, but com in, on an agenda completely, increasingly completely dictated by uh, big capital. So when we speak about crisis of uh, higher education, what I would suggest to do is to um, respond to the uh, to the insistence on the naturalness of this crisis, as if it, as if it were uh, a, a fact of nature, and we cannot do anything about it besides, you know, implementing austerity measures and policies. What I would suggest is to uh, rebuke this discourse of, of crisis by speaking of, of a different crisis, of another crisis, which is the crisis of the mission and a public and social role of higher education, which is what we have to uh, fight against, uh, not only to defend labor conditions and the right of students to study, uh, but also to defend what we think the role of higher education should be within a society. Thanks, Cinzia, and thank you, Nancy, um, for chairing. It's it's a real um, honor to be on this panel. Um, Cinzia ends at a perfect note from which it's um, important to start about what it is that we are fighting for. Um, 
and because it's clear what we're fighting against, but it's important to remember what it is we're fighting for. Because I think the right to education is actually a social reproduction right, because it is not simply about um, becoming more knowledgeable but about education opening the doors to a secure job, healthcare, retirement, it is a life-making tool. The 1960s student movements in this country, for instance, was about extending this right to life-making to underrepresented communities. So in 1968, when Ronald Reagan attacked the Berkeley student protesters as welfare bums, it was actually a prescient comment. He understood very well education for what it was, that it connected to other life-making work in a web of social reproduction. So this is the project that we are trying to recover now about universities being the center of um, life-making and education as a, uh, in a, in a, you know, in an effort to find our place back in society. What does the current university look like? One, it is precarious adjuncts, as Chinsia pointed out, teaching debt-ridden students. Two, there is a sustained attack on the humanities. And here I want to say that in, in the name of diversity, we actually have a continued devaluation of anti-racism and anti-sexism. 50% of students in higher education are currently food insecure, 22% routinely hungry, 64% are housing insecure, with 15% being actually houseless. In between 2004 and 2014, state appropriations per student in public universities dropped 19%, while tuition rose by 42%. Into this hellscape of neoliberal predation comes COVID. What was and remains an unmitigated tragedy for faculty, staff, and students was seen as actually an opportunity for legislators and university administrators. In May, this is May of this year, the Chronicle identified 224 institutions associated with a layoff, a furlough, or a contract non-renewal resulting from COVID-19. At least 51,793 employees in the academy are known to have been affected by these actions. Those numbers are much higher now once universities are back in session. A Washington Post analysis of federal labor data recently found that office and administrative staff employed by colleges have suffered the largest and most consistent job losses. These are people who on average earn be around $40,000 a year or less. And of course, if we look at the demographic of who does this work, we will find people of color and women uh, fill these ranks in disproportionate numbers. Federal stimulus dollars, of course, helped stem losses at many colleges, but recently the American Council on Education and other higher ed groups have estimated that this sector needs at least $120 billion in additional support, just to go back to where we were, you know, uh, just, just to keep that in mind. Now, one of the things to keep in mind, I think, in this context is that yes, state and federal funding for higher education has dropped precipitously. But we have to see this also in the context of where state and federal um, authorities are concentrating their funds. State and local spending on prisons and jails has increased at triple the rate of funding for public education for preschool through grade P to 12 education in the last three decades. And this is this is an analysis by the U.S. Department of Education. So, you know, if we did um, an analysis from a left-wing group, I think we would find uh, even more stark uh, data there. Purdue, my university, for example, proudly works very closely with Accenture, 
a company which recruits border patrol and enhances border security through digital means. This is now an accepted uh, position of this tying in of the neoliberal university with what Nancy has called necropolitics or necro-neoliberalism. The, the effect of this um, the effect of this pandemic onto this kind of campus has been absolutely unmitigated trauma for faculty, students, and staff. One of the recent survey um, by this company, Course Hero, of hundreds of faculty found more than 40% of survey respondents considered leaving their job as a result of the COVID-19's impact. Early career faculty members were most likely to be considered leaving, and that number was even more at 48%. What, does, what has work look like um, in, in, for particularly women with caregiving responsibilities during this crisis? By the way, universities have done very little in order to support um, people with caregiving responsibilities through the through the crisis, and so this burden has fallen disproportionately on women, both faculty, staff, and students. The Washington Post recently published a report where two faculty members measured the amount of time they could work over a three-hour stretch on a Thursday morning, while one person was on parenting duty for an eight-year-old and a twelve-year-old doing e-learning, and they wrote. I quote, the parent was interrupted 45 times, an average of 15 times per hour. The average length of an uninterrupted stretch of work time was three minutes, 24 seconds. The longest uninterrupted period was 19 minutes, 35 seconds. The shortest was mere seconds, unquote. So this has been the working conditions of a vast majority of faculty and staff and students with care responsibilities in the ha in the in the home, which universities have very have provided very little support for. I want to emphasize that while this has been the condition of the vast majority of students in public and private universities, the campus itself is actually sold as a particular kind of neoliberal experience. So for instance, on my um, college campus, there has been unprecedented levels of building activity where posh um, fa um, student housing have been built all over the town. And one of the um, student uh, flats, these are private flats that are being uh, marketed towards students, um, and, and the tagline for one of these uh, flats is, we build for people who expect more. The rent for these flats is $1,500 a month compared to university dorm rooms that cost $270. So the university is being, to, to follow up from the question of what the transformation has meant in the last 40 years, that from students, we now are trying very hard to turn them into simply consumers. And this is packaged in terms of the campus life being an experience, the campus housing to have the best gyms and the best workout rooms and so on. And so this is, this experience is limited of, can be obviously accessed by a very limited uh, number of students. And so this is the winnowing out of higher education from the social contract that the social movements of the 1960s won, okay? We are not just going to see uh, higher education turned into neoliberal paradises unless we resist. We are also going to see the demographic of universities change drastically, where only rich white students will be able to access this very, very elite experience of being educated. I want to end on a very grim but hopeful note. At the moment, since yesterday, uh, since a few days back, students at my campus are uh, led an occupation of the administrative building. 
they started this occupation because it came, uh, they came to know one of their peers, a student, having committed suicide in recent years, so the, in, in the recent weeks. So they occupied the um, administration, administration building demanding to know the extent of self-harm that students have undergone throughout this last COVID semester. I want to end there in order to highlight both the dangers ahead where universities may be turned into campuses of necropolitics, where literally people die uh, due to neglect and neoliberal commercialization. But I also want to end on the note of the occupation that we are looking at a generation of debt-ridden students with very little job prospects, but very high politicization for because the conditions are so dire. So I do not want to. I do not want to um, take away from the dangers of the neoliberal. Uh, what the neoliberal in university signifies for us, but I want to end on the note that we are also seeing a generation prepared to fight against it, fight for their lives, and fight for the right to education. Thank you. Thank you, Tithi. Thank you, Chinsia. Um, thank you, Nancy and Haymarket Books, Inspector Journal. Um, my name is Kathleen, and I'm a member of the Graduate Employees Organization, Local 3550 at the University of Michigan. We recently uh, went on strike uh, for nine days in the beginning of September, um, fighting for a safe and just campus. And I want to build on some of the points that both uh, Chinsia and Tithi um, have laid out. First, though, however, I want to acknowledge that here in Ann Arbor, uh, the University of Michigan um, is on uh, Ashinaabe, Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi lands. Um, and I want to acknowledge that our university stands, our university, the University of Michigan stands, um, like almost all property in the United States, on land stolen from indigenous peoples, and that the research um, at the University of Michigan has benefited and continues to benefit from access to this land. Um, gained through the exploitation of others. Knowing that doesn't change the past, but uh, a thorough understanding of the ongoing consequences of this past and its colonial present uh, can empower us in our ongoing efforts to see the land return to its original stewards. I also want to recognize the ongoing COVID outbreak that is taking place within Michigan's prisons, where there are currently over 600 positive cases of COVID um, last week alone. Since March, over 77 incarcerated people have died from COVID in Michigan's prisons. And I wanna call on the, the Michigan Direct, uh, Department of Corrections to increase the release of imprisoned people. COVID should not be a death sentence. And I start with both of these acknowledgements um, to, to really build on the point um, that, that Tithi made, looking at the way in which the, uni the neoliberal university fits into a landscape of eviscerated social services and social spending but uh, incredible increases uh, that go towards the incarceration of, of people uh, in the United States. Um, this is an important context to consider in our fight uh, against austerity, because in our fight for uh, education and, and for public goods and social services, um, we have to challenge the um, ongoing logic that has really underwritten uh, mass incarceration in the United States. And that's, I think, part of the project that on one side is the university, the other side is the, the prison, um, and that they are um, really in, in, in many ways um, under neoliberalism, um, kind of two sides of, of the same coin. I want to start at the University of Michigan, which is the, the public institution uh, which I, I work and I teach. Um, it's a university of over 45,000 students. It has the third largest endowment of all public universities recently clocking in at $12.5 billion. Like other public universities in the neoliberal era, the state, state contributions have dwindled while tuition has soared. In the past 10 years alone, tuition has increased 42%. The university's fin financial model is really invested and benefits from privatized healthcare. 
Most of its income comes from in the form of high cost elective procedures at Michigan Medicine. And other important revenue streams include unpaid student athlete labor, which generates hundreds of millions of dollars for the university as a division one school and the tuition fees from international and out of state students, which currently stands at around $50,000 a year. In the early days of the pandemic, the university dramatically announced it was facing between a 400 million to $1 billion shortfall, and it moved immediately into austerity mode, seeking to stabilize elective medical procedures, athletics, and in-person and on-campus university operations to justify its high tuition price tag. At the same time, the University of Michigan outsourced pandemic-related fi financial losses onto workers and students uh, through tuition increases, furloughs, layoffs, which of course exacerbates uh, in class inequality. Austerity measures disproportionately hit non-unionized workers, more likely to be women and workers of colors, color. Um, and we can see this, for instance, at, at Michigan Medicine, where one of the first acts was to lay off 38 emergency medical technicians in the midst of a pandemic. Those 38 uh, EMTs have not been rehired. We also saw this um, for, at, at, with the layoffs of 40% of lecturers at the Flint campus, which not coincidentally um, has a disproportionate number of uh, students of color in comparison to the Ann Arbor campus of the University of Michigan. On the academic side, President Mark Schlissel and the university administration prepared to reopen campus as part of the university's quote, public health informed residential semester. But there's very little public health informed aspects to this. Perversely employing the rhetoric of care by requesting students to sign the Wolverine culture of care pledge, uh, they asked students to promise to wear masks and wash their hands. When student, if students didn't comply with this pledge, there would be police. The university hired federal work study students to team up with armed campus police to patrol for non-compliant students as part of the UM ambassadors program. This at the same time uh, went into place without any adequate testing, contact tracing or quarantine plans. The university demonstrated its intent to reopen regardless of the human costs and against the recommendations of its own ethics committee, who argued that the university's reopening could cause grave harm to the surrounding community. This reality has borne out uh, as the university's housing has been the site of over 500 positive COVID cases, which has undoubtedly spread to the community. In comparison to smaller public institutions and private colleges, the University of Michigan is not in danger of closing its doors. Indeed, the university sees this as an opportunity, um, an ability to expand against competitor institutions that uh, with their $12.5 billion endowment. So it's within this context that the Graduate Employees Organization of the University of Michigan, which represents over 2000 graduate student workers, went on strike in September. GEO members led an explosive abolitionist strike for a safe and just campus, which was the culmination of months of organizing against the university's opaque and unsafe reopening plans. Now it's important and, and ins the university's insistence on austerity. This didn't come out of nowhere, of course. Um, GEO members were inspired by the uh, brave wildcat strikes throughout the spring and summer, led by workers fighting for safe working conditions like Detroit bus drivers, we also were inspired by the Chicago Teachers Union and um, United Teachers of Los Angeles and their willingness to fight for their students and communities um, against school reopenings. And of course, our strike, which centered defunding the police, could not have taken place without this summer's uprising for black lives. In this way, GEO always envisioned our own struggle, struggle as broader than just the needs of graduate workers. <clears throat> this was demonstrated in our slate of demands which called for the universal right to work, which would have set a precedent and made it easier for other workers on campus to work remotely. Robust uh, testing, which would be necessary to detect and contain an outbreak and protect the community. Support for parent graduate workers and international graduate workers who are struggling under increased caregiving responsibilities and buffeted by a political, hostile political environment. And most critically, um, our, our, our demand to disarm and defund campus police and to cut ties between campus and city police forces. Defunding became all the more urgent during the pandemic 
given that the university commits $12 million annually to the police, but has enough food insecure students to host a permanent food bank on campus. Of course, policing, while, while critics tried to say that somehow on one hand we could have COVID response and on the other hand we would have policing and that these demands had nothing to do with each other, as already argued, the university connected these issues for us um, directly through the UM ambassadors program. Um, and as we argued at the time, policing um, and, and surveillance are not, quote, public health informed. They're harmful to the physical and mental health of uh, graduate workers and the community. In increased police presence on campus and in the wider community jeopardizes the safety of our black and brown graduate workers, students, faculty, and staff. So by taking up these issues in tandem, we really uh, broke the narrow confines of what is acceptable for graduate student workers to bargain over. Um, and we forced the university to bargain around policing, something it swore it would never do. I can't go into so much of the strike here, um, but it's important to say that the, this, our strike acted as kind of a galvanizing um, event and it sparked two other worker actions, residential advisors in the dorms, really at, this, at the heart of the COVID outbreak. And these are working class students who are, work as residential advisors. They went on strike two days into our own, four days into our strike, student workers at dining halls and cafes uh, organized a walkout in a slowdown. And these, of course, are working class students who rely on the university for their housing meal and paycheck. And it's important to think about this when we consider the ways in which COVID um, is affecting different workers in different ways. And of course, the, the largest burden being on um, working class students um, and workers who don't have the ability to, to be remote. Um, I'll, st I'll end here but to say that the while GEO, we didn't get all of our demands, in fact, far from it, um, but the, the GEO members really, one, learned a lot of lessons. The first is that our strike demonstrated that workers can fight back. Uh, we can force the, the university, our employers, to bargain over things that they refuse to. It demonstrated that labor is a political force and that labor has a role to play in the fight for police abolition and funding um, community needs. Um, it also demonstrated that labor should and uh, can and should rebel against anti-union laws, which are on the books in Michigan that prohibit and public employees from striking. And of course, this had a qualitative effect on graduate students and on the campus, um, where we are find ourselves um, within a, a coalition of different labor unions on campus, the All Campus Labor, um, All Campus Labor Council. We've got student. Um, dining workers, we have residential life workers, all of whom are um, in conversation with each other, talking about what a university um, that would serve the people would look like. And of course, everyone saw that despite liberal rhetoric of dialogue, listening, or even care, that the administration um, was prepared to, to, to steamroll workers and students uh, in chasing tuition dollars and football revenue. While our experience of striking under pandemic conditions may not be easily replicable, um, the strike called up important questions. Who does the university serve? Why can't a portion of the $12.5 billion endowment be distributed to provide COVID relief, small class sizes, tuition reduction, greater testing? And why does the university spend $12 million uh, a year on policing? Our strike didn't answer these questions, but begins to put forward a role that labor has to play um, in fighting for a university um, for the greater good. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen, Cynthia, and Nancy, Cynthia, and Mark, and folks, and Spector. Um, uh, I'm so thankful to be here. Um, and the way I uh, frame the higher education uh, crisis is, um, I start like to start at the beginning, which I think is constitutional. Um, at many universities, um, board of trusteeships are usually filled with um, private sector uh, uh, individuals. And I think that tends to be the root cause of um, the challenges that we all face. Um, so when I um, talk about the board of trustees and um, and this constitution, um, this in many institutions, this is the organization that all decisions are filtered through. Uh, and often it's a rubber stamp. 
because those that sit on these boards are ill-prepared and ill-suited for this role, which is to direct the university uh, in, its, uh, in its goals uh, and make sure that it continues to be mission-driven. Uh, if you look, if you start to look at these, the the individuals who are on a board of directors, um, you'll see a lot of private finance um, and uh, uh, specifically um, real estate focused uh, individuals uh, in, in their careers, and that's also by design. Um, so I'm going to sort of talk about uh, who should be on the board of directors, why, um, and and why you or any individual who is part of an institution is to ensure that they're uh, represented in, in that area, uh, specifically on the board of trustees. So um, we have, uh, and but first we have to start off, why are the board of trustees, um, uh, or what is the, the logic behind the, uh, the board of trustees currently uh, on, in many institutions, which is they're typically shareholders who or individuals who can who can produce uh, the highest amount of funding for an institution. And as uh, you might suggest, I think there, it's, that is not the, the best qualifier for such, um, such a role. Um, so those who can fund the donate to the university. Um, but it's also uh, sort of a false logic because they are not actually those who are, are not the individuals who are funding a university. Um, when you look at, um, my colleagues have said earlier that sometimes administrative employees tend to be some of the lowest paid and precarious employees. That's part of a contract, a social contract of sorts, where uh, at an institution, there's some kind of job security in relation to being paid slight below market rate. And um, that contract has been in effect for many years, but, you'll, but the university system and as the, as the neoliberal structure has grown, has uh, broken that contract. Um, so in, in a sense, by taking below market rate salaries in return for, uh, um, for job security, um, an employee pays a tax to the institution where that institution is producing a higher profit. Um, so, uh, and, and year over year, uh, collectively, those staff that are doing that um, are, prob are paying more into the institution than its top donors. Um, to even further, you know, who should be on the board of directors, and my point is that staff should have multiple seats and labor should have seats on the board of directors at an institution because they are some of the primary donors to the university. I'll also start with the percentage of 0%. And why I say zero, because I think it's a strong number, but primarily, um, through almost every state in the country, uh, nonprofit institutions pay zero federal taxes on their um, on their property that they own. And for many states, cities, and municipalities, uh, I can use New York City as an example. Uh, Twenty nine percent of its budget comes from that property, um, from federal property. And so in return, it gets the, not only are the workers who end up taking uh, the burden of their tax dollars, having to fill the gaps where nonprofit institutions who have large endowments aren't able to um, meet its their their um, the community's demands. So that is coming from the tax base. So even so, even a larger percentage of the federal um, the funding for an institution is actually coming from the workers. The next uh, number I'll uh, use is very similar to what Tithia said earlier, which was $120 billion. Um, and I don't think that number is, um, when it comes to how much more funding a uh, the federal system, or sorry, the education system needs in order to uh, recover or keep up with demand of the high cost of education. Um, but that is actually the current number uh, uh, in regards to how much financial aid uh, institutions receive uh, it, in the United States. So we need to double that. But we also have to think that $120 billion is coming through the education system and is controlled by who when uh, ultimately. So we have $120 billion. We have zero uh, dollars paid in federal, uh, so, sorry, in uh, property tax. 
and we have administrators who um, who are underpaid uh, in a sense in return for job security that they're not receiving. Um, and so all this federal funding and state funding uh, is is given to the board of trustees who are by design those who have a lot of uh, are from uh, uh, organizations that uh, sorry uh, uh, that are again um, in the market of um, uh, real estate and um, and, and uh, finance and so the question that you really have to ask is why aren't faculty uh, on the board? Why aren't students on the board um, and permanent seats where they have self control or sorry, have control on who, who will control these seats as well as labor? Um, and, you know, labor, I believe, should be organized labor as well as seats for uh, for faculty. Um, but it can't just be uh, and faculty that are fiduciary have some fiduciary responsibility to their constituencies as well as as uh, as labor. So uh, individuals and then students who are also elected. So I think these groups must demand a seat and have a seat on a board of directors to right the wrong of the constitutional question um, and where most of these decisions and these these um, I guess these grave errors in how you're going to respond um, regarding the direction of education and the neoliberal institution can stop. And so, um, so that's uh, one you know, specific area, but uh, I think needs to change in regards to the uh, neoliberal institution. And then the second is regarding you know, contracts and broken social contracts, which I referred to earlier in relation to uh, low paid individuals at the institution. But those broken contracts are, uh, widespread and not just um, at low paid administrators, but it's also low paid student staff members, part time faculty. And there's a uh, organization little structure that is um, most most institutions are not necessarily aware of uh, where the university classifies different employees in different ways, um, but primarily um, it's based on the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, it's four categories of employee employees um, without going into too much detail about what uh, those classifications um, university if you uh, most university structures uh, take advantage of a loophole called the managerial rights loophole that is uh, been, is not explicit in the National Labor Relations Act but is a part of uh, Supreme Court um, decisions that create a managerial classification as it's implied um, and uh, and that which don't which traditionally do not have collective labor um, or, or labor rights uh, in the workforce. And so if you look at your institution and you see that majority of those, almost everyone you're dealing with is a vice president, you're going to really start to wonder and uh, you know, why is everyone a vice president at a university? And it is to try to circumvent the law in regards to who has managed, who is a manager and who is not. And overall, there's not much oversight uh, regarding, you know, classifications of jobs. I think the most oversight tends to come from independent contractors to ensure that the federal government gets their piece of the pie. Um, so the other classifications, cler clerical, professional, um, supervisory and managerial, are, you know, the federal government's really not looking to ensure that there's something, um, if, if everything is correct and, um, you know, appropriately classified, they don't care. Um, but there is another classification that is unique to the, uh, to the higher education system. And I'm so glad that Kathleen brought up earlier, which is federal work study. Um, and this is a classification that many people are, may not, be aware of, but traditionally it is for qualified individuals receive a grant of uh, from the federal government uh, to work on campus uh, for uh, a set period, less than 20 hours a week, and that funding um, usually allows uh, it's given to the institution to, to to deliver to the students, where the institution pays 25 cents on the dollar 
for every dollar earned by a federal work study employee. And the, the remaining is covered by that federal work study grant. Um, and these workers, this is, is traditionally, uh, and I bring them up because uh, when there are cuts throughout an institution, the real question is where does the work go? And these precarious employees who have almost zero rights because they're uh, because uh, the Higher Education Act uh, prohibits them from getting sick time um, and other benefits as workers' comp, et cetera, um, are where, where the work often goes, which is uh, very precarious employment. But we also have to understand, you know, if you're qualifying for federal work study, you're also, um, you know, uh, falling in a category of a, of a person of color, um, indigenous person, um, et cetera, who have traditionally been um, uh, on the receiving end of uh, these systems. So uh, my, uh, what I see as one of the you know, challenges, or at least one way to fight back, is to really understand the systems, uh, look, at the, look at the core root of them, um, but also under, and specifically, you know, educate yourself on uh, and what um, my local has been doing is on uh, on the Higher Education Act and how it's being imposed on the classification system and ensure that there's parity between positions and uh, throughout universities um, and and also educate, you know, administrative workers, students and uh, faculty on how parity and how to how to challenge if there's a lack of parity within positions and to, in order to make sure that there, it's, a, it's a fair working environment. Um, and then lastly, um, you know, I think it's what's extremely a useful tool is that when it comes to federal work study employees um, and, uh, it, and the work that they do, that it's governed by the Higher Education Act, which prohibits um, em employers uh, from using those funds to circumvent collective bargaining agreements, um, which is, uh, you know, the oversight is very limited uh, regarding federal work study, but um, to submit a com complaint uh, and organize around submitting complaints to ensure that people are appropriately paid for doing uh, 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 work. So if a, um, a, who is consistently in a federal work study classification, um, you can organize around such, um, such actions. Um, so, you know, in conclusion, I think that the, you know, the nature of the tax on education uh, and jobs really is classification based to try to make work as precarious as possible um, to, uh, you know, remove staff and faculty from the, from the uh, decision making process and, you know, as a way of, you know, resisting this is to make sure that you're part of that process, not on advisory boards, paper tigers, so to speak, um, but actually on uh, on the decision making bodies and having a seat at the table, which is, you know, and is an organized focus uh, uh, method to ensure that, you know, everyone is on the same page and working together. Thank you, Thank you. to all of our panelists. Um, I wanted to say, just as I was listening um, to all four of your remarks, uh, the, the amount of kind of cross-talk, cross-fertilization uh, was just striking to me. And as Henry was speaking, I was reminded of the significant um, student struggles and um, strikes, especially led by uh, working class BIPOC students in the late 1960s, early 1970s, that won the last major expansion, public expansion um, that we saw of higher ed. Those strikes included the demand that faculty, students, staff, and community members, people from the neighborhoods where the schools are, be on the governing boards, that the governing boards be reconstituted um, by and of the people who do the work and who live in and are affected by what the community does in um, 
or what the university does in their communities. I'm going to go straight to um, uh, the um, questions coming in from um, our audience tonight. And um, so I'll um, throw out a first question in a moment, and any of our panelists um, can come in to take that question um, up. And, um, and if it's one that you feel like somebody else has already covered, you don't have to come in um, and we'll um, just um, start going, um, going through these. Um, so Eric M. writes, um, I am from Connecticut, where there is a project to merge all the state's community colleges into a single institution. What's worse, this project is being carried out in the name of equity for the benefit, supposedly, of students of color. I am hoping the panelists can speak on mergers and consolidations as a tool to restructure and defund public universities in particular. And I think that um, the panelists can think about that both in terms of the kind of restructuring that's happening within your schools and universities um, and also any moves afoot, such as what we've just recently um, fought off in, in Vermont to consolidate and shut down um, some of the state colleges. So I'll throw that question over to our panelists. Okay, I would like to, uh, in this regard, I think something that um, has not been entirely mentioned uh, in, uh, in our introductions and that actually can give some elements also uh, with regard to this issue of consolidation and restructuring is the uh, basically, the uh, the growth in uh, in the past um, decade or two of uh, um, consulting companies um, that are hired for uh, an enormous amount of money to come uh, in, uh, and uh, advise uh, university administrators about precisely consolidation, restructuring, uh, closing, shutting down uh, programs, and so on. Uh, one such company, for example, is Euron, Euron Consulting, uh, that was also hired by the new school, by the way, and is still involved in the planning for uh, restructuring and consolidation, uh, because we will have one too, and uh, programs will probably be shut down. Um, but Huron has been responsible also for uh, um, uh, the restructuring and consolidation of in a number of public uh, universities too. And uh, uh, basically, once again, it seems to be that uh, the, the, the rule book that is followed by uh, university administrators is always the same. On, so we, they start with declaring an absolute emergency and uh, um, and crisis, existential crisis, and therefore the necessity of making very hard choices uh, without, you know, respecting all the cows, as uh, they like to say. Uh, I'm really quoting <laughs> like the language that administrators use. Um, then they bring in uh, external consultants, um, paying them, uh, uh, you know, between five hundred thousand uh, uh, dollars and a million in the middle of the crisis. To basically use algorithms to decide to determine on the basis of uh, basically entirely quantitative criteria and criteria that have uh, once again to do with the marketability to decide what programs should be shut down to decide who should be laid off uh, um, who should be offered early retirement and so on so i think uh, in, in one thing that we may want to do is to really map the work of these uh, consulting firms and the role they are playing all over the country um, uh, in terms of uh, what I was saying uh, before, in terms of you know increasing uh, absorption of the university by the capitalist market. So direct absorption, which also means precisely um, shutting down programs that are not um, sufficiently marketable um, and, uh, and this concerns especially you know, the humanities, uh, uh, programs that have to do with uh, minorities, uh, uh, and so on. Um, okay, I'll, I'll just add one tiny thing to that, which is actually um, the data on consolidation um, collected so far also shows that the project which the consolidation uh, claim what the project why the consolidation was undertaken 
does not actually work in the sense that at the University of Maine, for instance, um, they, they tried to consolidate uh, several programs and colleges in order to increase, um, rec um, sorry, enrollment, and enrollment actually continued to slide. Uh, similarly, I think um, the data on Georgia, where similar uh, consolidation projects were uh, tried, showed that it didn't save any sub substantial amount of money. So I think the, uh, the data is very unclear on whether, even if we take this sort of neoliberal idea that consolidation is necessary, even on those terms, the consolidation does not actually work. So that's that's one thing to, to say to begin with. The second thing I think is to think about what that means in terms of the effects such consolidation has. And I think the effect as, um, you know, uh, um, Chinsia pointed out is to actually sow fear into the campus that, you know, you step out of line, either in terms of your curriculum, i.e. you're teaching uh, material that questions the neoliberal project, or that you step out of line as, you know, several campuses, if you're unionized or whatever, then we're going to consolidate and close the programs in the name of fiscal efficiency. That is a term and a phrase we must contest at every stage. Universities are not there to be fiscally efficient. Universities are there to enhance human life quality. To go back to community colleges, I think the project also of neoliberal education right now is to actually um, fill community colleges with the kind of education that produces students simply as technical workers. And so community colleges tend to hire the most precarious of uh, teaching uh, staff and, and uh, strip their curriculum of all richness and educational uh, quality as if universities are there simply to produce widgets and those who will fill ultimately, you know, the cogs in some kind of uh, uh, workplace uh, operation. And so I, I, I am anxious about a educational landscape where fancy, important humanities subjects, the, the study of you know, literature, the study of art is considered fancy and is preserved to be taught only at Harvard and Yale, because I think these programs will remain. Humanities, rich humanities programs that teach us about the human condition will continue to exist, but it will exist in the Ivy League institutions, while the rest of us continue to produce a uh, widgets for um, uh, for the workplace, you know. So I think this this um, idea of consolidation is actually a tool to um, a disciplining tool for those who are straying off the political path, as well as a disciplining tool for um, uh, turning uh, even more the university into a commercial project. Yeah, I would um, just to, to add to that. Um, I, I do. Th I think that you know the, the big question we have to ask ourselves is who is education for? And um, and with these new structuring uh, and this, the and the and the pay structure of um, the faculty and staff, as well as the the tuition structure, you know, more and more we're looking at it that it is only for for is only education is is no longer uh, being marketed to. Um, to a community, but to an elite, and in, in that scenario, um, you know nobody nobody wins because um, even those who may not be the most successful in um, academia um, certainly uh, still fill the roles of um, of other underserved communities by bringing these these educational structures um, that may not be um, you know considered you know in the uh, in the landscape of. Uh, uh, of uh, corporate America to be the most uh, valued, but 
um, but certainly have an enormous value to uh, to those communities, um, such as even even if people end up teaching in high school. And so when we um, when we see those uh, those attacks, that's the beginning of destroying the marketplace um, uh, for for um, uh, uh, for teachers um, at different levels of the education system as well. I would just add that um, thinking about the University of Michigan as it currently stands, um, although it's different than, say, the entire uh, Michigan State College system, um, that across the three campuses of Flint, Dearborn, and Ann Arbor, there's incredible inequities. These campuses are supposed to are are, are supposed to be self-sustaining, and so what does that mean when Ann Arbor? which has an enormous amount of wealth, the majority of students um, is getting all of the resources and Flint and Dearborn um, are asked to, to quote unquote stand on their own. Um, and I think that there's that kind of, of, of logic of, of somehow, of even just within higher education, of this kind of like boots, bootstrap logic, which is being applied. Um, I think we absolutely have to, to fight, fight against. And, you know, when Titi was, was speaking uh, about the humanities as, as a luxury, um, that's certainly what we're seeing when we see state college systems um, and community colleges uh, being undermined um, and producing only technical workers. Um, but it's Audre Lorde who who said poetry is not a luxury, and I think that we need to to bring that into our movement and center that um, in our in our movement. And just with the University of Michigan, it has a lot of money, but its priorities, of course, are not in critical studies. Uh, it is on expanding its business school. It has a, a $300 million project to set up the Detroit Innovative Center in downtown Detroit on what was uh, previously uh, a planned uh, jail. Uh, it will now be the Detroit Innovative uh, System. And that's funded by Stephen Miller. Uh, I'm sorry, not Stephen Miller, Stephen Ross, um, a mega Trump uh, donor. So the ways in which business, of course, is dictating who gets the fancy buildings, who gets the funding, uh, is still very much part of this. And there's no democratic control. The donors are deciding the priorities of the university. Um, and I think that we absolutely need to, to fight for financial con control of, of our universities. Um, and really, on the state level, um, stop this kind of the death, the, the intentional death spiral of what um, administrators are, are putting on onto uh, our public institutions. Thank you. So another question uh, from the chat. Clearly, whoops, it just went away. Um, clearly, um, the problem of the neoliberal university goes beyond the United States. Are there any examples of successful push up, pushback against the necro neoliberal university, um, particularly in the pandemic conditions in the rest of the world that we might learn from? And I'm just going to add here that we can think about this both in terms of the context of the neoliberal um, defunding, um, uh, you know, of, of higher education, but we can also look at all of the other attacks on what the authors of the of feminism for the 99%, you know, refer to as the work of people making, caretaking labor. Uh, life making work and all of the uh, ways in which we are seeing fight back against that, which we might be able to draw on in our struggle for higher ed in the US. For, for me, the example that comes to mind, Nancy, when you when you ask the question about inter international struggles is, of course, uh, the successful movement um, in Chile. One of course, of students, I guess, what, two years ago um, in, in their fight against um, tuition hikes, but also more recently um, in Chile's vote to, to throw out the neoliberal constitution that was in, instituted under um, Pinochet. So I think that that really points to, um, well, of course, the, the international nature uh, of global capitalism, um, but also the, the 
kind of longer roots that go back to to the system in Chile, of course, which um, at, the, at the barrel of a gun enforced these really uh, the, sh the shock doctrine of, of neoliberalism. And so a rejection of that um, is really uh, inspiring. And I think we should take courage from. I agree. And uh, another example is also the extraordinary students movement uh, in uh, Montreal a few, from a few years ago, which literally uh, not only paralyzed the university, it, par it really par paralyzed uh, uh, the city and uh, and really uh, achieved a mass dimension that was uh, um, inspiring. Uh, but besides this, I think it would be important also the um, to you know to take into account uh, the you know the long history of uh, uh, of students uh, movements, especially um, in uh, in various countries, where uh, um, you know from the from 68 onwards, basically, when the where the movements have managed to really um, oppose a certain view of higher education, precisely uh, as uh, Titi was saying earlier, you know, predicated upon uh, the notion that uh, access to uh, higher education, especially in the arts and humanities, is a luxury and is, it should be reserved only for uh, for the ruling class or for for the elite. So where movements have really managed to tackle this issue, um, they have uh, really produced a process of, you know, democratization of, uh, of the higher education system. Of course, I have, you know, the example of Italy in mind, where uh, just to give an example, if I had been born in the United States, I would today not be, not even not be a professor, I would not even have a degree because I, you know, I come from a, um, a working class poor background and I would have not been able to afford, not even in my dreams, the kind of education I, I, I received in Italy. In Italy, it was possible because it was not only free, but it was, uh, um, uh, you know, it really was uh, organized around the notion that, that uh, to study is a right, is a fundamental right. And people uh, need to have the right to study regardless of their economic condition. Um, so this is what allowed me, you know, some, somebody, like, like, allow somebody like me to, to, you know, to go ahead and study and so on. And I'm basically first generation uh, graduate. So um, I think what, something that perhaps needs to be reintroduced in the discussion about higher education in the United States is really the notion that uh, to study is not a privilege. You know, to go back to what, also what Tiri was saying, to study is a fundamental right. It needs to be funded and needs, needs to be protected. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and around this, uh, it, is, it, would, it may be possible to uh, organize uh, nationally um, you know, a mobilization uh, or in the higher education uh, sector, because one of the specific problems of the United States is that uh, the, the uh, system is so fragmented. Um, and uh, uh, so basically, we, there is no national uh, system that can uh, provide a unified framework for struggle. It is extremely fragmented. The administrations are, you know, delocalized and so on. This, of course, and, and also the presence of the private sector that is so strong, um, produces a, a further element of fragmentation. So it's much more difficult in the United States to organize a, a, a movement um, for, you know, free education, for the right to education, uh, and so on. Um, but again, if we if we retrieve really the language, reintroduce the language of uh, uh, that was actually um, used in the past in the United States before you know the neoliberal attack of education as a fundamental right, uh, then we may be able to really um, try to unite forces across uh, uh, the nation uh, to really change the situation because it is obvious that the, the system as it is is not sustainable. So the example I would give is the Thai protests in recent times, right? So, um, I mean, they, they've become so wonderful uh, across the board now and, and with mass demonstrations and those fantastic um, challenges to the monarchy that we've probably forgotten that they began on university campuses. So it was students who first uh, started challenging uh, the constitution and, and demanding the reform of, of monarchy. And, you know, I think <clears throat> this is why universities 
have this double role in the sense that on the one hand, uh, as far as capitalism and the ruling class is concerned, universities uh, are spaces where young minds should be trained to join the system. But universities are also where young minds come to learn about ideas and hone their sense of rebellion against the very system, right? So, you know, throughout history, this is why students have always been on the forefront of mass struggles, you know, to, to give you a, a example from the, the, the history I teach, uh, which is India. Um, the, one of the uh, British administrators, uh, uh, Lord Curzon, in 1905, who tried to partition uh, Bengal, the, the state I come from, and, and you know, triggered this mass protest, which actually led him to leave. His first step was to pass the Universities Act because he thought that it was in universities that students were learning um, how to protest the British Empire. So he wanted to restructure the universities to, in order to stem or anticipate the, the, the right of protest. And, and I think Lord Curzon's exists today in various uh, shapes and forms, and sometimes even from the same class, that universities and our students are seen as you know, uh, the material to actually shape the capitalist world, but they forget that universities are breeding grounds for uh, rebellion and for movements for social justice, and uh, and and our students are often leading those uh, those struggles. So, uh, first of all, on that note, I, I'm just remembering that at the start of this semester, more than half of my students in my senior seminar were logging out of the Zoom call um, at the end of every class, going downtown to an, an encampment um, calling for police abolition and particularly for the firing of three racist um, um, cops and, you know, and just... Uh, so that actually um, leads me to what might be um, the last question I'll, I'll get to ask. Um, and uh, and that is, um, first of all, we certainly see within this um, pandemic that the attacks being carried out are sharply gendered, racialized, ableist, including with the programs such as women and gender studies, global studies, um, black studies being targeted for uh, uh, defunding and even elimination. Uh, but I'm also wondering if you can speak to uh, the uh, the role that uh, struggles against oppression surrounding the university um, and that our students are also deeply involved in, what role um, might they be um, playing um, in uh, our work to uh, fight back for higher education? And then also with that in mind, how do we build uh, solidarity uh, with undergraduate students? Um, so solidarity among students, faculty, um, unionized or not, staff unionized or not, graduate student unions, and how do we do all of this organizing in conditions of pandemic um, that are um, safe but effective? So that's a, a big uh, catch-all question. I tried to combine a number of things from the uh, chat, and uh, everybody can take up whatever uh, piece of it you would like to. So I'll start because um, this August, right before term was uh, about to start, um, I got fired uh, from my job as director of global studies. And um, the reason that was given was where we started this conversation, which was consolidation, that um, programs needed to be consolidated. But please mark which programs were being consolidated into one umbrella. It was global studies, which I teach as a uh, history of um, you know, sort of uh, global capitalism and struggles against it, um, African-American studies, um, women, gender and sexuality studies, critical disability studies and American studies. So all of these programs were going to be consolidated into one program. So disciplines, uh, uh, programs that are disciplines in themselves um, were being consolidated into one 
you know, umbrella issue, which uh, was about um, cost saving. And the reason was given was that, um, you know, th there was um, a se severe budget crunch. And yes, the governor of Indiana um, uh, cut the budget for Purdue by 15 percent, which is a lot of money. So I want to think about uh, what happened after we uh, built a campaign uh, to to restore the autonomy of these programs and to restore the right of our students to study in these programs without fear of these programs and their directors being dismantled. And the support from both within Purdue and internationally was overwhelming. And I want to emphasize that it was overwhelming not because uh, we had built this fantastic campaign, but it was overwhelming because people in other universities and other workplaces felt a resonance with this uh, with this cruel and unjustified effort of attacking these particular programs in a country with a virulent history of racism and within a, the the very year where we've seen such a brilliant uprising against it. So people understood our struggle as theirs because they have been fighting similar battles, not just in their uh, university campuses, but also in their workplaces, the question of precarity and, and so on. So I think the reason we found, and just so, um, people listening in know that the issue has not been resolved yet. And uh, we were simply given a one year uh, reprieve. Uh, the, 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 the protest against this was so severe that the provost immediately somehow found money and gave us the money to continue for a whole year. Now, we refused, as all of my uh, fellow directors, we stood in solidarity and collectively refused to go back because a one-year continuation is actually not sustainable for the program. And it is really uh, unfair for the students to not know what their future is going to be after a year. And so we're still at that position where we are refusing to go back as directors, of course, as, as um, educators and particularly, um, I hate to say this, as, as women, we are continuing to do the work, uh, you know, in, in a lot of ways. So, so it's been a, a, a challenge. But what I take from that is the outpouring of solidarity that we received through this process of building, um, uh, building uh, this campaign. And to me, I think, if we were to start a national conversation on overturning the priorities of the neoliberal university, if we were to start a national conversation on retransforming and reclaiming the university for ourselves, I think there is going to be a lot of resonance and a lot of solidarity. If I can add to this uh, wonderful remark, um, so first of all, uh, we, we, sh we should also take into account that uh, uh, the first victims of, uh, you know, the shock doctrine of these months have been especially, and, and this has been mentioned, uh, women and uh, uh, racialized people. Uh, why? Because precisely they are the ones uh, in, uh, um, in contingent positions, uh, because they are the ones working uh, as low wage, uh, admi administrative staff. And just to give an example uh, from the new school, uh, uh, since we are you know, offering also local examples, uh, the, at the new school uh, in October, 122 workers were uh, uh, laid off. Um, to this, we should also add that at least another 80 who were not recalled from four loss and uh, will not be recalled. And uh, the large majority of these uh, employee, former employees were uh, precisely low wage workers and therefore with a very heavy presence of women and uh, uh, racialized um, workers. The saving for this year of this operation has been, uh, will be five million dollars. Um, at the same time, the executive leadership of the new school, the, the total compensation of the executive, uh, the highest executive leader, le leadership uh, of the new school is $10 million a year, around $10 million a year. So they have basically thrown, uh, um, uh, you know, 
at least 200 people uh, into an unemployment, poverty, loss of health care, uh, um, of health insurance, and so on. While at the same time, administrators, uh, high, especially in the highest positions, are making an, an average of uh, $400,000 uh, a year. So um, this, to, to go back to the, to, the, to the issue of struggle, what I would like to add is that um, I think, so what we did at the new school was, on the one hand, uh, the creation of the uh, new school labor coalition that unites precisely uh, unions of uh, administrative staff and part-time faculty with the, the UP chapter that represents mostly full-time faculty, but not only. Um, but another uh, um, uh, key um, step, key moment of the struggle we are trying to wage at the new school has to do with activating a process of uh, um, uh, you know, discussion from below and participation from below uh, to, to think together what kind of university we want, so what kind of new, of new school we want. And this process, uh, and we really made a, a very firm point of this, this process uh, must involve together students, uh, uh, administrative staff, uh, uh, but also you know, facility uh, workers and so on, and, uh, and faculty at all levels. And uh, uh, of course, in order to achieve this goal, we need to, first of all, full-time faculty need to uh, start thinking about themselves also as workers. Um, of course, it's, it's a specific kind of uh, work and so on. We are workers and that we should be, we should unionize across the country. We should really um, stage a battle about this and we should really see ourselves uh, as connected, um, not only in solidarity, but also in terms of uh, uh, Okay, so um, I'll see if Henry or Kathleen sure. would like I, to come in. If I could uh, quickly um, jump in, um, and I can I can say, um, you know, when it comes to bringing in uh, staff and and faculty and students to the to the same uh, on the same page, um, our coalition is you know it is certainly key to that. Um, but also really bringing in the voice of un non unionized labor in and having a conversation that provides for them um, how to push back. Because um, I think that tends to be the fear factor here in, um, in after these cuts, you know, who remains is uh, an individual who is going to be overworked, especially working from home, uh, trying to navigate, um, you know, caregiving responsibilities uh, on top of, you know, numerous other ones. Um, about how to push back, how to maintain safety on the job, um, and also, you know, and, and talk to students about, you know, being overworked and what does that mean? Because that's a conversation that, you know, the university, most universities and education centers are not going to have with their workers. They're really going to say, you know, absorb the work, absorb the work and absorb the work um, of your cut uh, staff. And um, it's the first place to really push back because we do control the labor the, the, um, and the means of production. Um, and I know it's very Marxist, but um, at, at, at the core of, um, you know, our ability to push back is to um, make sure that work is being done safely um, and do not succumb to the pressures of an institution that is going to um, not really care about you if you pass. Um, and I think that's, you know, and respect your time because it's limited on this earth um, and, uh, and at, and many administrators at the university know this and part-time faculty, there's no memorial if something happens to you. Um, other staff members, maybe that is the case, but it's that we have to have that stark reminder that um, you know, it's not your job to, um, to make up for the mismanagement of an institution. And that's often the case where you, that you're, you will feel as an individual that you should um, you know, right the wrongs of that institution, and that's and and uh, by taking on workloads that are unsustainable, and that's not the way you do it. Form coalitions, um, educate yourself and other workers, unionize. Understand that tenured contracts without a union is uh, are very weak, and ultimately will not sustain. Um, you know, 
the, the court systems. Um, and so, you know, it's it'll go back to organized coalition building and attack the core uh, of uh, and of the problem um, across the university. Yeah. I guess I'll end by saying, talking a little bit about um, raising the question of what it what it means to be in a majority white institution um, when and taking on questions of anti-racism, um, questions of anti-blackness, which are very structural to the the institutions and and universities that we that we work in. Um, I think that it's really important with GEO strike, um, which did seek to defund the police. Um, it's important to note that there's, and as a majority white union, like that there's a, a lot of lessons that we need to learn from our um, comrades of color and centering their experiences and their voices, I think is something that came out of this struggle, which carries on into others. Um, because as, as, as everyone has laid out, the way in which the pandemic um, is affecting workers um, is, is different and differentiated based on, um, based on many elements of identity. So I think that that's, Thinking about the way in which the university's response, um, you know, just as one example, um, refusing to offer emergency funding, timeline uh, extensions to graduate workers. There are going to be students um, who have a cushion of, of money and are able to just take that on individually. They're going to skew whiter and wealthier. Um, and so thinking about the way in which the university um, the pandemic response is exacerbating um, racial and, and class inequalities. And for um, workers who are on that campus um, to center that. I think that this struggle, the struggle against neoliberalism is of course an anti-racist struggle um, at its heart. We've all kind of spoken about that today. Um, but it's also one that, that within our strike really, really kind of, um, Expand, expanded outwards. And we saw when we were on strike that we got all sorts of um, well wishes and solidarity greetings. Um, and one of the most really moving for me, and getting back to the question of the the, the pandemic and COVID, is that a nurse um, at Michigan Medicine called up and asked what, what we wanted, what she could do to support our strike. Um, and she donated food um, to our strike. And she, she donated it in honor of her late father, um, who would have been there. So that to me was a really important moment of, of saying that this is not just about us. This is also, um, of course, about um, nurses at Michigan Medicine um, and that it expands beyond us. And I think that that's really important um, moving forward. And I think that taking that um, as our struggle, of course, the old labor slogan, an injury to one is an injury to all. Um, but that has to be uh, continually motivating us. So I, I was cut off because my connection collapsed. So I was, I'm going to say the last thing I wanted to say, which is that uh, I really believe that um, it is only if we really manage to involve uh, the various constituencies of the, um, of the higher education, uh, so together um, faculty, uh, administrative staff, facility workers, and students, that we will be able to uh, fight back against uh, ne the constant neoliberalization of the university and reclaim our university. And this really means uh, activating a process of uh, mobilization discussion from below about what kind of university we really want. And this process really needs to involve, uh, uh, I think, um, in uh, um, students and the right uh, to education in an absolutely crucial way, because without the students, uh, I don't think we can, uh, uh, we can win the battle. Um, at the same time, uh, uh, only student movement would not necessarily address the, all the needs and, uh, uh, of, you know, workers, or exploded workers at the university. So we really need to try to frame our battle in such a way as to take into account all the various needs and demands uh, and uh, really come up with, uh, with an alternative. So what is our view and our vision for a university that really um, fulfill uh, its proper mission and is not a machine uh, for the production of skilled workers marketable on the on the labor market. 
Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, Chinzia, Tithi, Kathleen, and Henry uh, for this uh, in informative and inspiring um, um, conversation. And on that note of solidarity, but also uh, bringing people together to articulate what our version, our vision of the university is and how our vision um, is different from uh, what is being imposed. I think it's a, a great way for us to go forward. I also want to say thank you to Haymarket and to Spectre. This is the first of several webinars that Spectre will be doing over the next um, few months. These webinars, as well as the journal and the website, will draw on and develop the Marxist tradition to address capitalism's multiple crises and to uh, help that new generation of activists to build emancipatory struggle for all of our collective liberation. So again, I encourage you to go to specterjournal.com to subscribe and donate. And um, and again, thanks to Spectre, to Haymarket, to our panelists, and to everyone who joined us tonight. Solidarity.